Uh, to the meeting to explain the organization that she works for and to let everybody know, if you don't already know, that as of the 1st of July, she is going to be taking over for Brendan O'Neill, who after how many years? 30, 40? 38. Yeah. 38 years, he wow. is retiring. Um, and they've chosen, they did, they did a lot of work. I spoke to a lot of the board members and they searched and thought about it. And, and they came up with what I think was the best answer to the question, who's going to take over? And that's, that's Samantha. She's got the island roots, very deep island roots. She's been working at the, with the commission, at the commission for a long time. She's currently the director of Advo advocacy and education. And I think as a lot of you already know, she was pretty much responsible for pulling together the group that, that uh, instituted the plastic bag ban, the water bottle ban. And I guess in West Tisbury, she's given a lot of credit for helping them pass the big house bylaw, which reduce, you know, which limits the size of a big house. And she's also worked very closely with high school students, which we got to get the young people involved or we're not going to. They're not going to solve this problem for themselves. We'll all be long gone by the time we're underwater, I hope. So anyway, so without any more introductory, Sam, Mantha, take it, up, take it away. Thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> um, so I am not going to be able to do VCS justice in this quick presentation that I have put together, but um, I... I am really curious. I'm going to share just sort of some basics that are sort of our, our programmatic priorities right now and um, some of our just sort of the laundry list of, of land stories that we have. Um, and then sort of my thoughts, preliminary thoughts about where I would love to see the organization really spend a lot of its energy um, in the near term. And then I'm hoping that I can actually turn the mirror back to you guys to hear, you know, one of the things that I'm curious about as we think about what VCS does um, with its upcoming work is, is hearing, hearing what, what you all have to say about what you know about the organization, what you, what, you know, from either from what you know or from what you hear me share, any thoughts you have about what you feel like the vineyard needs, what the sort of environmental advocacy missing pieces are in your mind, because um, it's all food for thought as, as we think about moving forward. But I will, and I'm not a computer person, but I'm going to try to do my best. I will pull up this little, I have a little presentation, um, and I guess I should do a share screen. Apologies if I don't do this quite right. Oh, that looks good. All right. Can you guys all see that? Yeah. Okay, so that if you don't recognize it, that is a corner of Moship Trail, which um, looks out over land that has been a huge part of VCS's last, Richard, you may know better than I, like 25, six, seven years effort of- um, Long time. Yeah, on, ongoing efforts to conserve that really globally rare habitat. Um, involved very protracted legal battles um, and sort of slow um, acquisition of pieces of land, but it's certainly a very special spot. Um, so this, I don't know if the little band of faces covers part of it, but this is a footprints map that we created a number of years ago when we were celebrating our 50th anniversary, I believe, probably uh, six years old. But um, this sort of gives you a, just a quick snapshot of the scope of projects that VCS has been involved with over the years. I know I actually have sort of like a, I don't know if it's upside down, but sort of an unusual story maybe with VCS, which is I started there as a member of their board. Um, and when we joined the board, we're all given like a, a notebook, which is just giving us context and backstory and information about the organization. Um, and I thought I had like a general gist of, of who VCS was and the work that they had done. And I was so stunned by the numbers of projects that VCS had played a really critical role in. We're not, we're not a land trust. And so our name is never on the sign out front um, at the property, but 
there are so many sort of long facilitations that began or were very much aided by Brendan and VCS. Um, one of the ones that really stands out to me is West Gosen's Rock, a place that I love to visit and hike. Um, had no idea that BCS was in any way involved. And it was a huge, um, huge participation on our part in terms of working with all sorts of different stakeholders and legal background and, and getting that to a conservation outcome. Um, this is just a little list and kind of a duplication basically of the footprints map, but these are maybe some highlights of places that BCS has worked to conserve. Um, and then this is our sort of list of current programs. Um, the conservation restriction, like cultivating and facilitating um, new conservation restrictions or agricultural preservation restrictions um, and acting. I think Brendan as particularly has been such an incredible landowner resource. People will call the office. They are concerned about this. They're, you know, their family's wondering about that. And he can just, he provides, and, and the organization provides a ton of information. Um, Take Back the Tap is our initiative um, installing water bottle refill stations around the island. And this was, was sort of a parallel to the single use plastic reduction work that we were doing, the plastic bag ban that Richard mentioned. Um, and the water bottle ban that the students, the fifth grade, fifth and sixth grade students out of West Tisbury School predominantly advanced. Um, this was sort of, we saw this as kind of the other side. There was kind of the regulatory side, which was asking folks to you know, not do something. And this was trying to facilitate the change by having um, these refill stations throughout the community and, and creating more of a culture where we're carrying our own reusable water bottle and not needing to rely so heavily on single use. Um, art of Conservation is our high school and middle school art and writing contest. Um, we just, we're sort of actually in the middle of that right now. The artwork was um, on display at Climate Day. It was wonderful. And it will be on, we have an environmental film festival that we co-sponsor with the Martha's Vineyard Film Center, Film Society at the Film Center um, over Memorial Day weekend. And that artwork from the high school art show will be there as well. Um, our winter walks program, which you guys may, many of you may have attended these walks. There's sort of a different collection of walks every year. Um, our participation in the Island Climate Action Network, we are one of three steering members that puts together that newsletter and sort of directs the work for ICANN, um, the Climate Fair, helping Liz organize that. Although we are just a small member of that, that is really Liz and Julia carrying some heavy weight there. Um, Pons Films, the, I'm imagining that given this is the Water Alliance, maybe all of you have seen Ollie Becker's film on our watch that he worked on and released last summer. And we were a co-producer on that um, and looking forward to working with him going forward. He has two, two more, I think, in the planning process. Um, Vineyard Lawns is both an old and a new initiative. It's an initiative that began before I was ever even on the board at VCS. And we had you know, information for homeowners about having a more ecologically friendly lawn and little signs that you could put up about the lawn being chemical free and safe for pets and children. Um, and it's something that is a program that kind of went dormant for a number of years. And we've just literally last month, um, re, or actually earlier this month, relaunched it and are trying to sort of get that just in concert with programs like Natural Neighbors or Polly Hill and all the work that they do advocating for native planting, um, just trying to shed more light on what we can all be doing in our own backyards. Um, I think that's, that's sort of exciting to think about the different, different potential, like that we can all be part of this patchwork quilt of um, ecological health um, by, based on the choices we're making in our yards. Um, then recycling education. I'm always a little bit nervous about recycling because I feel like we lean on it um, as a way to not have to change our consumption habits, but it, doing it right still matters. And so sort of upkeeping uh, signage at all of our transfer stations and having flyers to get the information out into the community is something that we help with. And then of course our, our Earth Day beach cleanup um, that we do every year. And this year was part of the environmental festival at the museum. 
and a new program called Beach Befrienders, which is actually a month uh, a monthly beach cleanup. Um, shoot, I think I just jumped. Oh yeah. So then these are just current events that we're focused on right now. The West Tisbury Big House Bylaw Implementation, um, supporting the Climate Action Plan and different work that's coming out of that. Um, we're following the potential for regulating short-term rentals. Um, the innovative and advanced nitrogen septic systems and whether, most importantly, whether that changes their, um, the board of regulations for the Board of Health have sort of been a backdoor uh, hold on certain types of or certain areas for development. And if, if the septic system actually open up more opportunity for development, just kind of being aware of what that might look like and whether there are new specific regulations needed to fill that gap that the current regulations have sort of been doing by default. Um, community composting, hoping that municipal composting will be something that we have access to soon. Um, and always tracking the DRI projects at the Martha's Vineyard Commission and submitting testimony. And then the picture that you saw at the beginning, Moship Sanctuary, which is a current event, but a very longstanding ongoing one. Um, but I think one of the things that, or, or the thing that we just scratch our heads about and think, stay up late thinking about at night at VCS is the rate of development on the vineyard and the loss of open space. And this is a statement that comes straight off of our website. Um, and it's coming from actually from Martha's Vineyard Commission statistics about um, predicted growth and development um, that of our remaining open space or buildable open space, 80% is on track to be developed and 20% is on track to go into conservation. And that what that looks like is 7,000 new homes and an additional 9,000 guest houses and a doubling of the population, sort of the short version. And, and what does that mean for our community? Um, this is just another way of looking at the numbers. And I, the one that is, there are the three that I've underlined that are sort of the most striking to me are the fact that um, as of when these numbers came together, which I think might've been 2018, um, there's about just less than 13,000 acres that are fully subdivided and more like 17,000 that have the potential to be fully subdivided. Um, and that if, if I think about that sort of more than doubling of the developed space on the island, that is incredibly concerning to me. Um, this is a little graphic that we developed a number of years ago, which I find really interesting. We developed it as an advocacy tool, hoping that the you know, the pie on the right there that shows 41% conserved um, would, would be shocking and would sort of be alarming to people. I actually find it a problematic because I, I wonder if people look at this and think, how, you know, how could we expect more? Like this is, this is pretty, you know, this is, it's not half and half, but it's pretty darn close. And is it reasonable to expect more than that? Um, and so I'm just really curious, and this might be something that I would I'd be interested to hear your thoughts afterwards. How we keep the conservation sort of ethic and um, the urgency and the priority forefront on the vineyard. Like I, I sometimes have conversations with friends where they just feel like, oh, we're done. We have, you know, we've got great, great places to hike. You know, come on, you can't ask for more. Um, yet at the same time, I feel like I see our pond struggling. Um, I see traffic that's unmanageable. Um, difficulty for you know. I just I think that that we are bumping into issues, and that basically how 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 does this picture get better reflected? The need and the um, for protecting our open space and our habitat. Um, and then this, as far as what I would love to see. Uh, VCS prioritize going forward. It's basically this work and the paths to slowing growth. Um, and I sort of think of this in three buckets, which is kind of the top priority being conserving more land, that that's, that's a, a gain. Um, and then 
increasing the tools that we have to decrease the rate of development, that's sort of slowing down um, the loss. And it's also giving us time to work on conservation gains. And then what I mentioned briefly before, this potential for improving ecosystem health of developed land, optimizing our built environment. And VCS, I think, plays a very important role in education, looking for opportunity, seeking out funding, and thinking about needed regulation. Um, so land conservation, um, that would be sort of the first, my, my primary bucket that I would have us think about. Um, VCS, you could see from that footprints map, did a lot of work facil facilitating land conservation and still does some, but it has increasingly fallen to, you know, it's, it's our colleagues who are staffed for that, who maintain property have, you know, that we really tend to sort of rely on them to get the work done and to send them projects. Um, but I just wonder if there, if there is a role for VCS to play. Like I, I'm very curious about what all of our colleagues are doing where they feel like there are opportunities that are beyond either their interest or their bandwidth. Um, is there something that VCS could be doing to be helpful? Um, it may be that just being a general environmental advocate is exactly the role we should be playing and is most helpful, but I'm just curious about sort of reevaluating that. Um, and then being um, just sort of a louder voice for land protection in general and in service of ourselves and our colleagues um, to, to I, again, I just feel like I don't, I worry that it is a, among, among all the pressing priorities that our community faces, that it is a little bit falling um, by the wayside. And I, I just feel like it is so critically important that our climate resilience, our, um, our health, our spiritual well-being, uh, all of it ties back in my mind to having healthy and functional ecosystems. Um, and I think we are on the vineyard and I am sure I am biased having grown up here and loving it. So we have a unique and daunting responsibility to live in such an incredibly special place um, and be tasked with making decisions about how it's managed and how we we bring it into the future. What what do we protect of it? Will will we, um, you know, will I, I I think the place itself, its nature, is what drew and draws so many people here. But in our love for it and building our houses and upkeeping our infrastructure and expanding our infrastructure, are we overwriting it um, in a way that is going to be, at the end of the day, a terrible loss? Um, and so I hope, I hope, and I think, and I um, strive that that is, that is not the case and that we can find a balance, but I think it takes a lot of work. Um, so anyway, I think I touched on this, but like just, Curious what the missing pieces are and opportunities in addition to current approaches for land protection. It may be that they're, it's really well covered, but I would like to dig into that a little bit. Um, donor interest. Is there expanded capacity out there that we haven't tapped into yet? Um, and then this one is maybe a touchy one, but tension with affordable housing. I feel like uh, conservation and affordable housing get often pitted against each other as a either or. Um, and could it be a yes and, or however you say it, like, like how, how do we, both of them seem like such critical uh, aspects of a thriving community. And so how do both of them work together and come to the fore uh, and maybe some of the other pieces, um, whether it's not to pick on it, but second home development, more space made there to allow these two things to, um, be further prioritized. And then understanding vulnerabilities to the protected land we have now and ways that we can engage the community in this work. Um, slowing development, I'm curious what new and creative ideas might be out there. Um, whether it's, I mean, I just, I don't know. I just feel like we're on this freight train that is 
very quickly um, going to determine the outcome for us. And so I'd like, I would love to get very creative about what's out there that's been tried, what maybe in another community or that someone hasn't thought of yet, but just going through a really robust brainstorming and research process. Um, and then these other things I mentioned before, whether we will have additional development potential in areas that before were limited by Board of Health regulation and what is an appropriate uh, potential regulation structure for short-term rentals and fractional ownership and second homes. And this I think is, again, more things that I pretty much have touched on, but just where, where are innovations that we haven't tried? What are things we haven't thought of? What have we tried? What were the results? Does it bear trying them again? Um, what are, do we really understand what the obstacles are? Like, I'm always curious. I think it's very touchy to talk about slowing growth on the vineyard. All really, probably all of our, even my salary working for an environmental nonprofit, I am fully aware ties back to the strength of the economy here and even the second home market and wonderful donors who support our organization. Um, and so it's a very sensitive subject to talk about slowing the growth, but I just wonder again, whether as a community there, um, there is a balance that doesn't have to be frightening and whether there may be more alignment amongst different, like the building community, the conservation community, um, but I think, it, I think we make a lot of assumptions. I think it would be great to really know what the real obstacles are so that we can approach them. Um, and I also wonder about whether um, some of the goals that came out of the climate action plan um, are just naturally in alignment with changes in possible development patterns or slowing growth, looking for those opportunities because that's just such a win-win if it's building our climate resilience and accomplishing the work of the CAP and helping with land protection. And then again, I just, I'm always curious about the, how to get the community really tied into this work. Um, and then improving ecosystem health on developed land. Um, I mentioned the Vineyard Lawns Program. Uh, one of the things that came out of the work of the West Tisbury Big House bylaw effort was that, yes, these big structures were of concern to the community, but also of equal concern was the scope of projects that, that um, whether it was alteration of the landform through extreme regrading or replanting, um, all of sort of outbuildings and hardscapes and infrastructure, but, but really the sort of taking a, a piece of land and sort of re-sculpting it um, for a project above and beyond in the building, in the course of the actual building, but to, in all of the other related land work. Um, and that started a conversation about whether there needed to sort of be a parallel regulation that looked at maximum disturbance percentages maybe for a lot. And it's a totally nascent topic and um, could go in any direction, but I think it's an interesting one. Um, and then there's great work, as I mentioned before, coming out of Biodiversity Works with their Natural Neighbor Neighbors Program, um, Polly Hill and others. Um, in the future, whether or not the down island towns are appropriate for big house bylaws, how they would maybe get tailored to work in those towns. Um, that is of interest. And then these are just some basic questions I have when thinking about this work. Is there any need for us to have a specific goal for conservation gains? There's sort of the popularized elsewhere in the world or globally, this 30 by 30, conserving 30% 30 of the planet by 2030. Um, we are fortunate that we have already hit 30 here on the vineyard, so that wouldn't be our goal, but is it, is it important to have a goal? I guess I, I wonder about, um, or is that limiting? Um, do we understand, and maybe this is a silly question, but do we understand the needed criteria for a healthy and resilient island community? Like what, what does it look like for us to thrive? When have we gone too far? What is build out? That could look, I'm imagining any number of ways, but 
Um, I'm just curious, and I'm, I'm very curious what comes out of the carrying capacity study. Um, what other science and data do we need to answer these questions and craft meaningful responses? And then again, affordable housing, how, how do these two work together and sort of changing the narrative that the two are, are often pitted against each other? And what builds connection and commitment to this work in the community, which gets to sort of the final piece that I think is so important to VCS's work, you know, in addition to regulation and advocacy and um, sort of digging into land protection and slowing growth. I think that, um, you know, what drives that is caring about this place and creating for our organization, creating opportunities for people to, like many of our colleagues do as well, which is so wonderful, know this place well, care about it, know its biodiversity, know its natural places, um, and have a passion for protecting them. And so that is my like super slapdash <laughs> crash course through VCS as it's been and as I would love to see it go. Um, and I would be really curious to hear from you guys um, what you think about, you know, generally where we're headed as a community with regards to development and open space protection or, or any questions or things I could clarify, but I'll get rid of this. Well, Sam, that was fantastic. That was, did you just, did you put that together since we talked, since we talked last week? I have a few of those slides from something else I did, but yeah, pretty, for the most part. Wow. <laughs> but I apologize because it was, no, oh, whatever. That, you brought, you, I kept thinking of other things and then you, you, you would bring them up. So, I mean, you've covered, unless, you know, I'm sure we'll hear from other people, but I, as far as I'm concerned, you covered all the issues. <laughs> There's just a lot of questions out there. A lot a of lot questions. Of questions. Yeah. Oh. No, I love, every time I was like, I'd love to, I'm sure there's a creative idea out there somewhere. That's not an answer, <laughs> but. Well, that was a great presentation. More people have got to see that presentation. That, that was fantastic. That was fantastic. All right, open it up. Uh, stick your hand up if you know how to do that. That would make my life easier, but there's not that many of us, so I should be able to see y'all. Okay, I see a real hand right there. <laughs> Dan. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Sam. It was great to see your name in the headline. Thank hearing about you. that announcement, really good. And um, that that um, conversation about those, you know, what's often framed as competing forces of affordable housing and um, conservation. We are having, the, uh, you know, discussions at the Tisbury Master Plan level that I've been involved with that I think definitely have implications for not only you know that entire paradigm but also for different towns as well which is basically you know we all recognize that Chilmark, the Quinas, what you know they can they are made possible by virtue of our down island towns right and the density found in them the workforce housing predominantly founded by that founded they found there um so there's conversation about same thing. Should we be promoting, accommodating growth, you know, as far as population growth goes in Tisbury? And if so, mm. should should some of that come with expectations for the up island towns, right? Like I, I'm just kind of speaking, you know, just very conversational here, but yeah, I don't think anyone. In, I don't think Chilmark wants to necessarily have a zero, you know, as far as their affordable housing unit inventory goes. When it, when the existing units on the books sunset in in <clears throat> the upcoming future, um, but at the same time, they're not going to really be the bastion of affordable housing, right? I think everybody recognizes that as well. So if a if a down island town, in this case Tisbury, kind of agrees to take on that role and kind of double down and promote density in those kind of select areas so that up island towns can kind of 
you know, remain and retain the character that they have now, are there financial kind of arrangements that can be made to assist and sort of augment that effort? And I and I bring it up only because I, I, I'm always wondering, you know, how does that conversation take place? How do you move that sort of dialogue along amongst the people who actually make those decisions, right? So within the Chilmark um, policymakers and elected officials, right? And I, I would imagine if it's a position that VCS kind of takes and has some, you know, sees it through that kind of lens, I would imagine that it's their board members who live in, often live in one of these six towns that hopefully can be part of, you know, building traction and um, kind of momentum within their respective towns. So I'm being a little presumptuous thinking that is your position, but ecologically, I'd be curious to know if, you know, you feel like you guys are trending in that direction. Um, you know, knowing that additional residential units are needed, but we need to be, of course, careful about where they go, right? And who they are for. Yeah, no, I think that um, as far as when you say, is that a, a trend or a direction that, that we're going in? Do you mean this notion of more density in Down Island and preserving rural Up Island? Is that what? Yeah, you're... I think so. I mean, because I, I think, you know, while we don't all agree on like the, the rate of growth, like those numbers that you rolled out, is probably not something you guys are in favor of, right? It's a, it's, yeah. uh, but rather we agree that, probably agree that either some growth or at least infill will need to take place to accommodate the demand for workforce and community and affordable housing. Um, so how does that then, you know, fold into the converse, the conservation co conversation, right? right? And how do those things both sort of move forward in tandem? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know that we definitely favor, um, you know, the development in areas of infill close to services. Um, I, listening to you when you first started speaking just makes me realize like how biased I am being, you know, I'm, I grew up in West Tisbury. And so I like, that's sort of the lens that I see the vineyard through is, is having this sort of like rural West Tisbury childhood and, um, and that it is, it's not, I don't know, reconciling sort of like, is it fair for the down Island towns? Like are the down Island towns happy to take on that role or, or whatever, I don't know, happy is the right word, but like willing to take on that role. If there's some sort of, as you're saying, you're su suggesting like a kind of a financial benefit, I'm assuming is what you're getting at to them to do that um, or some other like give and take, um, or is that simply just, I don't know. And it, I don't know, it gets all these things in my head. Like it gets back to the whole six town where everything on the vineyard goes to where, you know, when we, if we don't think of ourselves as a whole and we think of, um, yeah, it, it sort of changes the calculus a little bit, I think, in terms of, of how you organize and make land use choices because you're, you're thinking about your corner of the pie instead of the, the whole island and, and how to make those land use choices. I mean, you at the MVC, all of you who work for the MVC, I guess, actually, have the um that bigger lens of looking regionally which i think is so important um but anyway i'm totally digressing but i think i think my short answer it would be that vcs would probably be in favor of a situation that you describe i'm wrestling myself with is that fair <laughs> um, right right and and i don't even know if that's you know tisbury's position on this it's just it's been a it's been a conversation that's definitely taking place and knowing that significant investment will be needed to achieve some of those housing goals in in those down island towns it's just it'll inevitably inevitably go to how do we pay for this right that that, that type of thing yeah. 
but I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, I think you make a good point. Um, this whole controversy about the regional high school um, budget is just sort of an indication of what it's what it's like to share the expenses. But the project that just got approved next to the ice rink, I attended, I think, most of those VCS hearings. And I never heard that. Nobody ever asked that question. I thought about asking it, but I didn't ask it. Who's going to pay for these kids to go to school? I mean, I think it's a great project. I'm all in favor of it. The town of Oak Bluff shouldn't have to take pick up the tab for all those kids to go to school. So I just that's my I just want to weigh in. Rachel, go ahead. Uh, on I mean, this is obviously a hot topic, and Samantha, thank you for taking on the the huge responsibility and acknowledging the um, you know the tension that exists between the two of them. And I would say, you know, yes it makes sense for affordable housing to be near an area where there are more services. Um, but as somebody who grew up in affordable housing, um, I would say a lot of people want to live in the community where they work. So, you know, to say, yes, you have, you know, affordable housing in Tisbury, but you're working in Aquinnah or, you know, you're working all over the island. That means you're not really going to be a part of those communities. And I think that's something for BCS to take into consideration when they're thinking through areas of conservation and community and where affordable housing might fit in. So it's my two cents. Thank you. No, I think you're bang on. Like I don't, I don't, I get nervous about, you know, as much as I like diehard land protection, that is like my just passion. <laughs> um, I get very nervous about any situation that um, starts to, I don't know how to articulate quite right, but like starts to sort of parse things too rigidly. So if we, like, for instance, if we were to say like, we're really going to focus on doing all affordable housing and infill in Down Island, and we're going to really focus on doing all conservation up island and maintaining that role of character, that would make me very uncomfortable. Um, it just, it feels like, yes, services and or proximity to services and um, infill in already developed areas. I think there's a lot of, I just don't think it needs to be hard and fast one or the other. I think there's like a lot of logic to that and, and importance to that, to taking advantage of those opportunities, but not making other opportunity not at the total loss of other opportunities not making it also just like there there is no affordable housing in Aquinnah or Chilmark or West Tisbury that 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 also needs to be for the for other reasons for like as you suggest for preservation and and richness and diversity of community like I think that's that's in that's to me those are the two things that the vineyard is in the crosshairs of losing is it's like richness of community and its richness of biodiversity and like what two things could be more important? Like those just seem like the two tenants, the two pillars that hold up a community are its people and the place that that it houses them. Um, and how do we how do we support them both really carefully? <clears throat> Please. Hi. Um, thank you for that presentation, Sam. And I'm so happy for you and for VCS and for the island that you're in this position. It's really exciting. Um, and, you know, I, in thinking of the big picture, you know, continued growth is just not a sustainable economic plan. It's just, we're going to run out of our resources. We're going to, our ponds aren't going to be usable. Our fresh water is going to be at risk. It, we just have to find another way. And with climate change, we need all the natural resources and we, they're all stressed from climate and we need to protect as much of it as we can. And I'm I'm gonna say this and I'm I'm not gonna say it. I'm just gonna say it from a personal perspective. I, I I think we should start buying as much conservation land as fast as we possibly can as a community. Um, I don't know how else we're gonna protect the land and the island. I would tend to agree, Liz. <laughs> I want to. I want to still be able to house our community, but I also would 
I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of an extreme. I would, if I couldn't live on the vineyard anymore because it was in the best interest of like, okay, we've decided this is just a place that there's the political will to turn it into a biodiversity hotspot. I would leave sadly, but willingly. Like, I just, I think that there, it's just such a special spot. The land bank has an interesting program where they're trying to buy up houses in the line of fire. You know, that, oh, as the ocean comes back, you know, up towards their property. I think that's a interesting concept, but of course they're buying things that are going to be going to disappear. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a tricky, but it, and on the other hand, these houses do have the ability, I think under the current zoning, that if they want to raise their house up, they can do that. And that's the last thing we want to do. We've experienced what it means to build a raised up building in Vineyard Haven recently, and it's horrible. So I don't know if that's a great answer. John, I see your hand up. Sam, thank you. Uh, <laughs> that was an extraordinary presentation uh, that in its depth and breadth um, shows off the incredible significance of VCS, which I, I think is um, often, and perhaps for many, uh, a hidden asset um, along the lines of, well, for example, uh, looking at the vineyard, the publication of the Vineyard Open Land Foundation many years ago, you know, the degree to which I think many people, including people I'm closely related to, don't know why it is that they're able to enjoy the views along roads as they drive up island and elsewhere. And it's because of work by entities like VCS and the other organizations on the island. So pursuant to that, one thought I have is that perhaps everyone would benefit, including VCS's partners, if VCS uh, and its role was flagged and noted uh, in every context, including particular sites that other organizations own or manage, um, so that uh, if it were the case that VCS is more known than what was implicit in what you stated, which is that funding limitations, well, funding constrains what VCS can do. And if more, and you noted potential for possibly for more donors, but if more people knew about VCS and if they knew about it because VCS got credit where credit is due publicly, um, then VCS would benefit and it, all of its um, collaborators uh, and colleague organizations would benefit. I wanna note that, that VCS played a role from the beginning of the Martha's Vineyard Water Alliance, from when it was the uh, <laughs> Martha's Vineyard Watershed Team. Uh, this was, of course, the name was, of course, absurd, um, but a consequence of the incredibly wonderful, well-conceived program at the state level. Um, I, I never liked it because there is no Martha's Vineyard Watershed as such, and team makes it sound as if uh, well, we've already got a shortstop, thanks. So you you know come back some other day. Whereas Alliance is very open, but Brendan O'Neill was at the table literally uh, from early on with the the watershed team. And then when that state initiative died, uh, and people within the the that group chose to continue as the Alliance again, VCS uh, played a key role, and VCS in that context also overlapped inextricably with Rick Carney's efforts for the Blue Pages. And my recollection is that it was VCS's board member, Joni Ames, mm. who, when working on the Blue Pages, came up with the, the brilliant name of Vineyard Lawn. Um, I also want to point out that, as far as I can tell, and I'm not a professional historian of this, um, that it was VCS, which, remember, is the Vineyard I'm saying this rhetorically, is the Vineyard Conservation Society that really first emerged as a vineyard environmental organization. And that was when uh, the late mate Edie and others, including Joni, uh, led VCS's um, uh, ex extremely significant efforts to address uh, all of the issues that, that were being dealt with by the Water Alliance and before that, the watershed team. Uh, and I think that that's another 
very important aspect of ECS. With respect to some of the things that have been discussed, in, including development, the percentage. Um, I mean, I have I have friends and colleagues that are in uh, you know, nature needs half and uh, half earth. Uh, incredibly, those two entities remain in parallel and not overlapping and, and coordinating. Uh, and now we're talking about 30% instead of 50%. But with respect to the numbers on the island and the vexed issue of, of affordable housing and the good points by Dan Doyle um, about you know, the share of, of Up Island, I'm just wondering about, the, the. it seems to me, the clear utility of running the numbers. If we look at the trade-offs and what the costs are, and what the benefits are, because we have a limited array of options open to us. I mean, one of which is burying our heads in the sand. And then, but that's a, we can just base our scenarios on what the outcome of that will be based on what we know so far. But it might be easier to talk about these things in, in terms of some of the questions that, that Dan raised and many of the points that you raised, Sam, by just looking at the different scenarios that are consequential to uh, choosing any one of the, uh, the different options that we have. And that may make it easier to engage the public uh, because then rather than pre being presented with, with something that is in a sense without any kind of context or they have a basis for comparison. But again, my thanks to you and best of luck to you with this. Thank you. <laughs> I need it. <laughs> By running the numbers, do you mean sort of like, um, sort of forecasting like economic outcomes or um, for the different scenarios? What what would the... Well, yeah, good point. Uh, well, for example, I think at least 18 years ago, uh, the commission had run the numbers with respect to the rate of development and uh, one aspect of that being the number of cars. My recollection is the very vivid point that if the if things continued uh, as they were at the time, then eventually um, the island's road systems would simply be a giant parking lot. So with respect to affordable housing, if there are different options open with respect to up island versus down island, or if it's within Tisbury, where it is in Tisbury, and if it, it's a certain number of units that are going to be built, what are the options for placing, how, in this case, affordable housing in one place versus another? And what are the costs and benefits of the different options for that? Yeah, I remember when the um, uh, SSA wanted to build the new slip, the second slip, put a second slip in Vineyard Haven. And it was approved, I think. I think it had to go, I'm not sure. I think it had to go before the NBC. It was improved with a condition that, oh, we promise we're all going to use one slip at a time. <laughs> That's pretty funny, isn't it? Rachel, get your hand up. Uh, on the, referring back to John's comment, let me just hold my hand. Um, on running the numbers, I would say, Sam, um, one resource that um, you were happy to share with you um, is that in the process of doing the reports on all up island ponds for the watershed management plan, we did put together more recent development, um, you know, numbers with the help of Chris Seidel from MBC. So now we do have a sense within, you know, the last two years, certainly, where um, the more dense locations are, what their their land use is. So you know we have that information available for you if, if that's something you're interested in. So regarding open space development um, and also you know what is potentially available for development. So great. just let me know if you're interested. Okay, that's great to know. Yep, Sherry. Um, I just wanted to say Paul had to go to another meeting, Paul Bagnell, uh, but he said, Sam, you will be great. So I wanted to share <laughs> <talk> with you. <laughs> Very generous. Coming, from Coming from Paul, that means a lot. Um, I know maybe this is might be like pie in the sky, but is there any 
way the island could do like a brief, I know this is really pushing it. Um, I still believe in unicorns, I think, but to do a master plan for the island, it's like, what do we want to see this place be? Um, <clears throat> you know, they all need to, they, you know, finances are making them start to realize that they need to work together more. Um, I don't know. I, I, would love to see it, but I just don't know. Have you felt the temperature of any of the towns about, you know, their, their thing? Well, obviously West Tisbury with the big house, they're thinking about it. Oh, oh you're frozen. Sure, he went frozen. Um, until Sherry unfreezes, I'll start to answer, which is, I, I mean, I feel like we a bit have the temperature of the towns, but again, I don't, I don't, I, I worry that we sort of have an, uh, you know, some, some information comes out of, you know, we read it in the papers, it comes out of town planning board meetings or MVC meetings or whatnot, but um I still feel like there there is a degree of assumption that threads it all together. Um, and so I, to Sherry's comment about, you know, is there the need or the ability to have kind of an island-wide master plan? Um, I guess I don't know the answer to that. I do, it does feel like um, attractive <laughs> to sort of have this, this sense of of where we're going together and and what our ultimate goals are and and when we make choices to um, deflect from those goals, you know, we you know the the rationale for doing that and sort of maybe an additional level of care goes into the thinking when we do it. Um, I also am just so. I would love to better know the temperature of the community in terms of concern, no concern. Like, are people generally happy with the trajectory that we're on? Is it, are people concerned about traffic or concerned about the ponds or concerned about, like I, is there, is there, I always wonder from BCS's standpoint, is there more political will than we think to make some of these changes? Like, I, I think, we are always concerned like oh man we are rowing up a rapid river going the other direction but i just sort of wonder how much that is the case i feel one of the things that i would love to somehow think about how to create is a forum to have this kind of a conversation like what what and it it's probably lots of little forums that you're knitting together but um are are we worried that the vineyard is gonna, you know, some some people I hear people will, talk, will sort of throw around like, oh, it's gonna become like the Hamptons, or oh, it's gonna become like the most densely developed parts of the Cape, and and then you're gonna actually see, you know, a lot of the the money that's driving the economy go away because it's sort of been like quote unquote like ruined. Um, is anyone worried about that? Um, not even thinking about it from an environmental standpoint, but just sheerly from a, like economics and um, community growth and character standpoint. Um, I don't. I don't feel like I have a real. I have like assumptions, but I don't feel like I have like a hard and fast read on that. And that to me is a big missing piece. But I, I just want to chime in quickly. Let me get two hands up here. Um, it's about. It's about, I feel like it's about fighting the money. You know, the vineyard has become an investment where you can't, you can't lose, you know, unlike the stock market, prices just keep going up and people don't realize that something's gonna happen and that's not gonna be the case. But right now, people are willing to spend and spend and spend and that's what we're fighting, I think. I think the local community sees it and they don't know what to do about it. And then you have the, I, I don't know how to refer to the the immig immigrants that we have here that have come here to work to make money so they can send it back to their families so their families can survive. And they're loving it because the, the more lawns they get to cut, the more leaf blowers they get to blow, the more money they make. 
and so we're fighting that too. It's 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 really a a bunch of different economic levels that are sort of trying to make it all work out, and I'm just not sure how to do it. And I, that's why I think VCS is is one of the toughest organizations. You guys aren't out there to make friends. You're not like Sheriff's Meadow. Please give me money and we'll do whatever we want with the property next door to you. You, you are there to fight the battle. Take on the legal. If you need to challenge somebody, you take them on. And that's what we need. That's what we need. But it doesn't it doesn't always attract the donors that you need to, to do the work you need to do. Go ahead, Liz. Thanks. Um, you know, Sam, you and I have talked a, a a lot about the need for more communication on the island about these issues. And, you know, one of the big um, places, I, I think that the town leaders, the boards of selectmen and the town administrators need to be educated on what the financial impacts of climate change are on this island and, and how, how much that's going to cost us in terms of, you know, um, adaptation and, um, you know, cost of living increases, insurance increases, it, and and the fact that conservation land doesn't cost the town any money. It's taken off the top rolls, but it doesn't cost in terms of town services, and maybe that's a way to sort of approach them in terms of looking to the future, because they're going to be in fiscal hard times if they don't start planning for this, and I don't think any of the towns are thinking about this yet, because it's not right in front of their faces. It's something they're thinking is in the future and they can worry about later, but we have time now to plan this wisely. And I think, you know, educating our town leaders is, is something that maybe we ought to think about. Yep, and I think you've done a good job of that so far. Dan. Um, I'm, I'm not, a, just personally, I'm not a believer in people will stop coming here um, mm. if things start to go south. I think people's desire for vacation is always relative to where they're coming from. And if this represents something that is still relatively better, they will continue to you know, show up. The one exception to that is maybe if we can demonstrate that publicly accessible beaches that would otherwise migrate, you know, barrier beaches that would otherwise migrate naturally, if those will be inundated and, you know, there will no longer be public beach access, that that could be the one wild card that I think could be meaningful. Um, but I, where was I going with that? Well, I, I'm just, I had another thought, but I was also curious, what is the, the what is BCS's distribution list because I have to say you guys do a really good newsletter I get a lot you know we all get flooded with our inbox it just stacks up on distribution list but you I noticed like you guys are the one newsletter that I actually try to set us go out of my way and make sure that I read it because I think it's done really well um and I'd just be curious to know and I'm not going to ask you to share it with us but I just curious to know have you guys kind of um, bucketed out your year round versus seasonal mailing list. And I'd just be curious to know what your volume is for each of those, you know, two buckets. Yeah, that's a good question. And I don't even know that I can answer that with specifics. Um, I will say, I will tell, I will pass that on. Jeremy gets, Jeremy Hauser, for those of you who don't know him is my colleague at BCS and he is responsible for our print and online media and like pretty like wholehearted like like we we help him but he pretty much does it he's amazing um okay so I will pass that on to him great um, and I, I oh sorry go ahead no but as far as as numbers and year round versus seasonal um I'm I bet Signey would know Signey or Jeremy may know I actually don't know what it is okay and, and here's where I, now I remember where I was going with the other um, part of this. You know, Richard brings up that good point. Like there is a, an economy that relies on a lot of these services. So I think to the extent that we can, in a compelling, a really compelling way, document, quantify, showcase that demand will remain for all these services. It may look a little different, right? These services may shift a little bit as far as 
the skill sets and the applications and just the, the, the types of services, but the jobs themselves, you know, the job titles themselves can remain. If people are just working on retrofits, um, renovations, reuse projects, as opposed to new construction, that there is still enough demand and the pie is big enough for, mm. for you know, the, 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 the workers in those respective sectors. I think that's going to be important because I just witnessed at, you know, Tisbury Town Meeting, zoning bylaw was on the table for revision. And honestly, it was only three or four people who would, would have been directly impacted by it that I'm convinced like thwarted that entire bylaw. You know, it, 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 it's a few people who are impressionable, or I'm sorry, it's a few people that are impacted that get up and whether they're informed or not, if they get up in opposition to something, town meet, there's, a, there's enough voters that are impressionable that it makes a big difference. So the whole like lead up campaign to any, any types of policy decisions that are, decided on town floor, I feel like is really Im important in addition to any, you know, policy decisions made at select board meetings, but um, all right, that's enough. Thanks. No, I, I think you're absolutely right about town meeting. It's a, it's a wild card. <laughs> it has to be handled carefully. Um, yeah, what, right. the, what was the bylaw in Tisbury that it was basically just trying to have a more balanced like you can keep this many tr um, work trucks on your oh. you know this size work truck on your property your residential home property um and 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 it was something the building inspector wanted to give himself more standing when he goes to enforce bylaws and try to thread the needle between residential and commercial uses in our neighborhoods, right? He actually wanted it, um, but nonetheless, it went, you know, it it didn't pass. Hmm. I think mostly it was because of the number. They only said like one work vehicle. And I think that was too low because there's a lot of, you know, working class people that, you know, your wife works for the company, the husband works for the company. They've got two company trucks plus their own vehicles. And all of a sudden they're not gonna be able to keep those cars there. They just, I think it'll pass next time. It's just gotta be re reworded, you know, cause they don't want like a bunch of trucks. Um, like, right, right, yeah. They're just trying to find a balance. Yeah. yeah. I was, I understood what they were going for, but um, it just wasn't worded quite correctly. So yeah, I, and it's, you know, because the you know, what are the options? It's if they don't park them home, where do they where do they park them? So. Yeah, and it goes back to that bigger island wide conversation of you know, if we need land for these specific commercial uses, these industrial uses for storage, for equipment, right, for fleets, um, where is that going to most likely be, and at what expense, right? Like, <laughs> so. You know, it's it's probably a select few areas that can absorb it on the island. Um, so what's the trade-offs there? Um, I got to jump on a 130 call, but it, it was great um, joining this afternoon. Thanks for putting this together, Richard, and um, glad you already hit the ground running, Sam. Nice to see you, Dan. All right, bye for now. Thanks, Dan. Oh, I think I'm I, sorry. I'm gonna make you host again because I think I'm I'm host by because when you left. Sam, I'm so glad you're asking these questions, and, and it's great to hear people responding. And it's it's really been a good good conversation. I, th yeah. I think that, that that's why I've been involved in so many different organizations, and the the, the uh, commission is 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 one of them. That everything is related. You know, some people are big on protect the water. Other people are big on housing. Uh, they, other people are big on open space. They all are related. They all have an effect on something else that somebody else might want. So it really, people need to pay attention more. And, and talk about town meeting. Another thought I just had was 
You'll have people show up at town meeting who have never been a member, a volunteer in any committee in town. They don't know what's going on until they walk in the door of the regional high school. And then they just put up their hands and say, oh, what? We can't do that. Can't do that. They don't know what they're talking about. But it, they're the ones that get the attention and that can turn the tide. It's just not fair. You got to get involved. You got to get involved and understand the interrelatedness of it all. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, John. I think the, the thing is, we need to be that much more proactive and effective at communicating and educating. I mean, another of the many reasons why it's great that Sam is going to be at the helm of VCS. Um, years ago, uh, under certain circumstances, uh, late spring, I sometimes ended up encountering the entire graduating class of the regional high school. And um, because of where this was occurring and why and at what time of, of, of day, usually after midnight, um, I would often use the opportunity to ask my captive audience what in, encounters, if any, they had had with, with island NGOs. Uh, and environmental organizations and there would usually be silence and then and this was decades ago and then some of them would pipe pipe up oh gus ben david came to the high school and spoke and and at that time the Vin martha's Vineyard environmental education alliance existed and and we talked about this sort of thing but i i think you know today obviously it's very different with respect to the Limited amount of involvement uh, with the high school exemplified even just in one case by the, the conservation society's uh, art competition uh, with the with the middle school. Um, but I'm I'm thinking there are other opportunities that that are open to us. I mean, there's there's the cable television, the work done by people in the Water Alliance like Gail Tipton and and others. I guess probably Joni Ames and so on. And I'm out of touch with that. And in, in making videos to do with water prior to the you know the the more sustained or feature length professional efforts. But we talked years ago with Rick Carney when we were doing the blue pages about, for example, engaging with the Steamship Authority further to captive audiences. Um, you know, if there's a way to communicate with people at, at the key points uh, where, where people are engaging with, with the vineyard, uh, with the blue pages as well, we talked about the Chamber of Commerce, talked about realtors, um, thought about engaging plumbers, for example, who are obvious candidates for uh, involvement with water issues. And I, I'm just thinking if we keep expanding the network and the, the contexts and and we're gonna have to do the job. We can't we can't expect um, people to to arrive at town meetings well informed un unless we do it. And I'm not I'm not criticizing your comment in any way, Richard, because I I I probably share your frustration um but anyway i think that's something where vcs can lead and whether there is today any kind of a regular alliance of a regularly meeting alliance of island conservation organizations beyond the issue of you know where do we spend the money mm -hmm. um that would likely be a great benefit i mean for example w w w would it have helped if the water alliance had had a table at the climate initiative day. Uh, in the past, the Water Alliance had a uh, a stand or whatever one calls it, a fair. Um, you know, but to to seize every opportunity to do that, and I know that's something VCS does. That's it. Yeah, I have. I have to your point about sort of new alliances or strengthening alliances. I have wondered if there is. Um, the, an opportunity for, you know, there's a conservation partnership that is there to put heads together about amongst the colleagues about land protection, but it's very focused. Is there um, an opportunity for all of the organizations that interact with environmental messaging or advocacy to come together um, to have a bigger voice? Because it seems like, you know, if you look at sort of go down the list of any recent DRI applications to the Martha's Vineyard Commission, whether it's Meeting House Place or um, 
I don't know, artificial turf, or I don't want to, I actually won't name any because I don't want to get myself into hot water, but there's, you know, even Poly Hill and Biodiversity Works and Great Pond Foundation, there's an increasing number of organizations that are voicing concern around these issues. And um, it just feels like it, maybe it's just to me, because it feels like there's like strength in numbers and it's just sort of, it's hard work sometimes. And so to be to feel like you're a supported part of a community instead of, again, being that little boat against the rushing river, um, it, that is helpful. And um, I think it would be an interesting thing to pursue. Maybe we should require that everybody that wants to live here has to attend a class on the status of what, I don't know, speak. it'd be like a two year course. You'd come out with an associate's degree in Martha's Vineyard. The Vineyard you know, Way. The Vineyard, there you go. That's great. There you go. Liz, that's your next job. <laughs> it's required. You have to you have to at least get a C plus. <clears throat> Anybody else? Get some John. Sorry to keep talking, but I think I there are examples of alliances uh that are incredibly effective. Um, for example out of the pioneering work um, by the late Jerry Studs uh, in having passed through his uh, subcommittee back in 1989, the, the first uh, act to set up a fund administered by the US Fish and Wildlife Service for an endangered species um, that gets bipartisan support and is still going. And that's the African Elephant Conservation Act. There's been any number of analogous acts passed. And over the years, uh, an alliance has formed that is now many dozens of NGOs, you know, some of which like the AZA claim, I'm not saying this formally, claim a constituency of several hundred million Americans, which is, you know, everybody who's ever been to a zoo. So these organizations like World Wildlife Fund have enormous clout, but they meet fortnightly um, and divvy up responsibility for uh, dealing with, in their cases, uh, legislation, reappropriation, reauthorization, new legislation, and so on, and uh, coordinate their efforts to make it happen. And I find that, you know, there's an absolutely unassailable emergent property, you know, where the, where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Um, and it's because they're talking and, and they've formed relationships with one another that that then affect other aspects of the work that they do beyond the work done by their directors of legislation and public policy. And I'm thinking that that, you know, back to the points that, that you and I were exchanging in a sense, Sam, in this case, that it would also, I would think, benefit the vineyard um, if if there was more conversation and discussion like this, the the issues would emerge, would be identified, and then the strengths that that the components, um, all the different organizations and groups on the island would bring, can bring to bear on these things, ranging from communication to VCI's, VCS's traditional role as an advocate would be identified. And I think it would also help in, in, for, on the island to in dealing with the island's uh, state representatives, uh, as well as uh, the U.S. representative uh, serving the area, as well as the two senators for Massachusetts, if there was a unified voice um, and and continuity in 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 uh, interactions and less relationships with with them and their offices. And I I would think to to go into it not with the assumption that one has to have worked out ex exquisitely carefully. Uh, before the first meeting, what is going to emerge from it, but to e explore it iteratively to to see what emerges as it goes on because it'll it'll evolve. One thing that the, the, we have a climate action task force and now we have a brand new affordable housing task force. I wonder if a land task force might be something to think about. Mm -hmm. Both of those are housed. Those are both commission task mm -hmm. forces. <clears throat> I mean, I would be ecstatic to see the commission put that kind of weight behind that, behind land by giving it a task force. Ooh. 
Well, Sam, I think you got your job cut out for you. <laughs> well, thank you all for inviting me and listening to me and offering your wisdom. I think the answer to all your questions is we all have to work to, more closely together instead of everybody in their own corner. Yeah, that tends to be the way. We can save time and money and get the job done faster. So the next time you have a climate action fair like you did that Sunday, we'll just get together an hour earlier and then sit there and just bounce ideas back and forth. <laughs> yeah. Like we don't have time. But that was that was a really great time to get together and just chat. And, you know, because we don't see each other. You know, I was talking to the people at the state forest that day um, and what they're working on. So I thought that was the best part of that whole thing was seeing people I hadn't seen before, you know, and getting to talk to them face to face, not on a screen. It's very nice. Yeah. Very nice. All right, is there anything else that anybody wants to uh, talk about uh, with their own organizations or are we done? Just congratulations, Sam. Thank you. <laughs> I, I've got a Water Alliance question, if I might. Sure. Um, I'm wondering if, if there's a role for the Water Alliance in having it collating and, and making available what the town, the different regulations are uh, town by town for, for example, what people are allowed to do with respect to spraying, for example, for ticks. Um, I've spoken with people who, who find it difficult to, to learn what's going on even within their own town uh, with respect to that, um, you know, whether there could be a, a matrix or something available to compile that along with other sorts of information. Or, or perhaps also direct people. Um, so they go to the, the commission, look into water, and there'd be links or the, the information if the MVC doesn't want to actually be responsible for um, presenting what, what is a town by town thing. Anyway, it's just a thought. Yeah, that we could definitely put it on the page. Water Alliance has their own page, um, just putting it together. Um, I think we might start with the boards of health because they've done a lot of with the ticks, they've done a lot of things and maybe they would want to, you know, just take that idea to them that, you know, people don't know what to do in their own towns or how they should do it. And maybe they could kind of put something together because that they've done a lot of work with ticks. I hate to shunt it to somebody else, but they might've already done something like that. So if you don't mind talking to the boards of the Board of Health, the, the whole island Board of Health, I, you know, I'd be more than happy to put it up on our link, uh, up on our webpage. Okay. Um, I, I have a question about that. Is the spraying for ticks, is that a different, is that regulated differently than fertilizer use? Are those two separate things? We didn't have, um, we didn't have the power to regulate pesticides. That's a, that's regulated by the state. So we couldn't say anything about any chem, pe pesticides, chemicals. So yeah, it's, we have, we couldn't control that, but yeah, it's, it's important, you know, what to use and you, you don't want to get bit by ticks, but you also don't want to be giving your dog cancer or yourself cancer. So it'd be nice to, or wildlife. You know, what will work without killing us and getting in our groundwater. So yeah, that's really, that is, that is important. I think that's a good idea, existing regulations. And also we've had discussions recently about maybe new regulations um, that people think might be a good idea that maybe could be brought up on the website alongside of the existing regulations and see how people feel about the new regulations. One, for instance, what I'm talking about, leaf blowers. You know. The state's looking at gas powered engines, just you know, they gas powered engines in general. Yep. Hmm. Absolutely. Um guys, oh. if I can interrupt, I actually am supposed to be or was supposed to be at a meeting at 1 30, so I should sign off. But thank you so much. Great. Right. Thank, thank you thank so you. much for coming, Sam. Best so happy. congratulations and good luck. Yeah. And we talk to you often. 
Yeah, reach out to any of us. There's a lot of knowledge here. I would love that. I will. Thanks for being here. Bravo, Sam. Thank you. Thanks, right. Sam. Good luck. Okay, anybody else? All right. I think we've done it. It's too bad we didn't get a better turnout, but can't have everything. I know. I'll spread I'll the word. Up. Get it on the website. Spread the word. Okay. Yeah. And if uh, anybody has any ideas for next month or how we can increase our membership to coming to the Water Alliance meetings, uh, let me know. Um, it goes out to everybody. Um, the sooner I have like a speaker and an idea, um, the better, because then I can give people more heads up. So maybe it, it, it kind of gets some maybe your, generate. your idea that, that you had mentioned to me about going back to meeting in person, you could sort of put that question out there and see if, see if people would rather do that. I mean, you know, obviously it, whole world could have been here and we didn't get a good turnout. Whereas at the meetings, I think we always used to have at least a dozen or more people. So maybe that's what people want to do is meet in person. Okay. We could do the, the June meeting in person. Um, then we usually take July and August off because everybody gets so crazy. Right. But we could do the June meeting. But if anybody has any idea of what you'd like to talk about, let me know. All right. Very good. Thank you for putting this all together. Sure. No problem. Thank you. Uh, okay. We could hybrid too, because the commission has that ability. Yeah, so. well, that's a good idea. I mean, it's, I don't think it's that much yeah. more work to allow people to come in virtually if they want to. Yeah, maybe we can make cookies or something, try to draw them in. Oh, there's a good idea. Be We're going to hold you to it. Okay, <laughs> I'll make cookies. <laughs> Chocolate, please. I, I'm not, I'm sort of a lapsed member, but I, I want to put my, in. I can only attend by Zoom, just so you know that there are some people that would attend by Zoom, but not otherwise. Right. Not in Great. So we could definitely do a hybrid. We now have the capacity. It's, it's working. <laughs> so, okay. Thanks, right. everybody. Thanks, everyone. Great bye -bye. to see you all. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. See you next month.